we're going to do is, our idea is to do something very simple for about an hour, which is to say, like you heard in the sessions this morning, that part of thinking about how to understand the urban, how to read the city, how to work in the city, is knowing how to ask the right question. And actually, very centrally for us, is the idea of saying that we have for some time been asking not quite the right question. So if you hear Prasad and Mahit speak to each other, one way to describe their entire question is saying, what is the question when asking about planning and informality? And if you keep asking, what is the informal sector, then you can't have the discussion they have. If you keep asking, how is planning different from informality, you can't have the discussion they have. You have to find another way of asking the question, right? which is Prasad, the formulation of, if the city is not informal, then what is it? Right? So the question of framing an inquiry is a way to go back to say, before we do solution, before we do technology, before we do method, before we do data, what is it that we're trying to do? What is the way we're framing the question? So we're going to do a, a little dip into this, which is to figure out, talking amongst ourselves, what it means to frame a question in different ways, and why some of where we ended up was because of the question we asked in the beginning, instead of implementation failure, corruption, governance. We know the unfamiliar diagnosis. So we assumed we were doing the right thing, and something got lost in the way. Who are you? But this is to go back to first principle and say, if we know what to do in the first place, if we know what battle to pick in the first place, right? Great, so we'll be drawing on this. The way we're going to do it is there's four of us. There's three doctors and one actually smart person. That's the way this works. When we put them together, we'll be in the four, four corners of the room, and we're going to ask you to just self-organize around them, just pick one. If you see organically, informally, in an unplanned way, one group is getting too large, go the opposite way. This will cause the group to then coalesce and bring up in the wrong place. Then you will move again, you will move again. Several of you will be in the middle, not knowing where to go. Several of you will first sit and wait to see where others go before you decide going. Because this is actually how cities are made. This is also how you will reorganize a lot of this. Several of you will get up and be the person who is in traffic jam, is the civilian standing, stops the Maruti and says, go, go, and then becomes the intersection manager. Several of you will be looking to see who that guy is. Okay? So let's see how you do this. So, Anand, corner. Karen, corner. Prasad, corner. I will be in that corner. Lift your seat, move around, find wherever you want to go. They'll be similar. In half an hour, we de -grab, regroup together. Okay? Okay, great. Um, for everyone who is now not part of the non-aligned movement has picked something or another. So your task for the next 30 minutes is this. We have to report back from the group with no more than four questions. Okay? Those four questions should come out of half an hour of us processing different kinds of questions, making some bigger, smaller, editing, framing, combining, reworking. Starting with a set of questions that become more complex, that they it out, and thinking about what we're really looking for is to say, if we were to take four key questions of the moment, four questions that we must be asking in our cities today, what are those four questions? It's not about ranking hierarchy, whatever, every group will come up with a different priority list. The idea is not to find number one. I just find that because this set of people sat together, what represents some set of shared collective priority for our question, we can choose anyone to work on. Okay? So it doesn't mean you have to say environment is more important than housing. That's not the fight you have to have. If you want to do an environment question, do one. It is what it should be. If you want to do a housing question, do a housing question. If you want to do a violence question, do a violence question, do a gender question, do a gender question. But pick one and then work through it so that it comes to a point where we are fighting about what a good environment question is. Have you on that? Yeah? Yeah? Okay? Alright, then we'll come back and report and do all the work. So 30 minutes from now. respond back from the group for just about five, six minutes each um, and lay out some of the kind of discussions we had. Um, 
And after this, we have tea for half an hour till 4.15, and I hope many of the discussions will continue, and other group members will add and share with each other. So our basic point was to think about how to, how the way we frame questions influences not just a sense of entry point, priority, political power, method, mode of practice, how it points us in certain ways of understanding things, how it points us in certain ways of framing things, and also some of the dangers on how our questions can lead us to unexpected situations. So I'll give an example of the question that came in our group. We opened with an idea of how can we understand, uh, the question was, how can we talk about the root cause of informal settlements which lies in the lack of affordability in the housing market? That was reframed by somebody else to say, how can affordability find a place in planning? And we talked about the distinction in the way these two questions were phrased, and how the second one was taking an object for planning in which if a new concept was added, existing processes like plans and master plans could function differently. Two questions that led to very different ways of acting and framing the issue. From this, we got an example of questions that then sought other ways to think by either historicizing or creating comparatives. So the idea was there must have been settlements before formal planning. Is it not possible that they were organic ways in which people sharing space found ways to, as Prasad would say, work it out? And we framed as a question, we thought about that and say, how did by what are there organic logic by which people sharing space find ways to work it out together? And our inquiry became, in a sense, more historical, more conceptual, looking for other ways and knowledge information. We then changed and talked about a question that came to us, which to say, that can we re-ask the affordability question differently by asking a broader question, who is entitled to what kind of space in the city? We talked about how framing the question this way opened up multiple different possibilities for us, but also it allowed us a key concept, and that's a point the group would like to leave, that because we use the word entitlement, we enter into a very different kind of arena, but also one that is fundamental now about democratic power, about fighting for whose entitlement, but also about the delivery of entitlement, that we use the word entitlement, not right. right? We then started talking about a different approach where someone said that the question they wanted to put out was how do we build and sustain faith in institutions? So now we had gone from affordability and planning. We had gone from questions of, of, of studying market to thinking about entitlements as the way in, then to suggest actually if the institutions were just, then the rest would work out. Now this pointed us to both disciplinary backgrounds, this pointed us to different entry points, and we thought if you fix this part of the pipe first, the system will work better. And the argument on institutions led us that the diagnosis of the question was actually about trust. And one of the things that made us realize also that all our questions have assumptions and diagnoses already built into them. Right? Where because our diagnosis of the problem is a breakdown of trust, our question is looking to build better institutions. We then talked about different ways of thinking about how to ask, and some of that was this is actually a lot about power. And then we struggled to articulate a good question around power. How do you ask a good question that captures the complexity of power? We tried two. Do I have a right to my city? Was one. Now this brought in a different language from the entitlement question. More metaphorical, more abstract, less hard to pin down. Or the other question, am I getting the best that I deserve in my city. And we talked about the difficulty of this idea of entitlement and whether, and a question of whether uh, the idea that because I contribute, I should get the best that I deserve. And how different questions have very different political salience in different times. So the question of getting the best that I deserve in 2016, in a question of citizen governance, RWAs, a lot of elite organizing, is very different from an earlier time. And we came to another principle about why different questions pop up and become important at different times. And what it tells us about reading the political climate. And what it means about our strategies on framing, for example, this morning, should we frame the question of the SEZ in Chennai as an environmental question, an economic question, an equity question, a developmental question. Right? Each of them is a different uh, resilience. And our last point here is to uh, a very interesting debate, oh, sorry, second last point here, a very interesting debate 
where the question was asked on how do you deal with the conflict that arises from gender disaggregated access to resources in the city. And then we debated whether the question should be specific to gender or asked more broadly on questions of identity and what we get when we keep specificity and what we lose when we don't make the question more expansive. Because it also allows other people to say, I tell you the word gender wali baat and tune out for five minutes. Right? So I think one of the things that we ended on then was a very different way of questioning where the question was raised, how can I reduce my travel time in the city from point A to point B and at what cost? And we talked about the importance of a kind of question that can be quantifiably and empirically answered, both in what it opens up as practice, as politics, as a way of speaking to a public that is, considers this the only valid way of argument, and in its limitation, because it reduces us to a number. But at the same time, we talked about how the question of how long does it take me to get from point A to point B is also a question of how close can I afford to live next to where I work. And it's also a question of land use and affordability and the structure of the city. So it's not actually only a question about efficiency in transport and how many minutes on the bus. It's actually a much deeper question about the connection between work, place, residence, employment, and pleasure in the city. And therefore, how even a question that looks very specific, very narrow, very sectoral, and very empirical has within it layers of asking much bigger questions that can be wielded to ask those questions. So that was the uh, response from group one and our reflections on inquiries and questions. Yes. Hello. So um, we did this slightly differently in that, uh, or I've got to do this slightly differently, in that uh, we got a range of concerns and questions from the group and uh, we sort of found that we had like four largish bags of questions. Uh, one to do with housing and a whole set, actually started off with a whole set of questions around land, around the different meanings, different values of land, the different rights and stakes and the different kinds of um, access issues. A lot of questions to do with urban land and the pulls on urban land. So we tried to frame a question around that. We had another set like this around housing, another one uh, to do with planning and questions of formality, legality and negotiation. And a fourth one to do with um, public systems, uh, such as public transport systems, and why they become inaccessible to parts of the public. So what uh, we had, we set certain guidelines uh, to massage these bags into questions. And uh, one of them was uh, um, to do with uh, that the questions should open up rather than close down. So they should be framed so that you can give an already known answer to them, that they should open up uh, inquiry. There should be a way to explore uh, various possible answers to these questions. Um, uh, the other one, of course, is that the questions have a lot of stakes in them. They, they, they bring up certain politics. So the questions should also sort of touch on these politics and try to engage with them. And a, a lot of the questions we try to frame in terms of processes. So when I'm talking about uh, opening up, they should really show us how these things are grappled with on the ground. You know, how does, uh, uh, and, and the, the other thing that we uh, started uh, realizing when we were framing our questions is that it works when there's a tension. So I'm going to ask group, my group members, uh, each of whom took one of the questions that we were working with and, and has sort of done the final formalization um, to actually share the questions. So that you'll see the tension in them as well. There's a bit of this, but a bit of that, and how do we then uh, come up with an exploration of these questions. Uh, so the first one uh, is on land. So we started thinking about how uh, we, uh, okay, I'll just read up the question. Uh, how is land valued differentially by different actors? And what factors, processes, and contestations go into defining these values or meanings? And how are these values or meanings related to the idea of property? And what implications does this have for distribution or access of all related stakeholders? So there's like a four-part question, which is to do with exploring, you know, the diversity of value meanings. Then uh, how this one axis, which is property, can uh, influence this sort of values meanings thing. And then how the certain outcomes to do with distribution, access, rationing, markets emerge out of that encounter of property with their diverse values and meanings. So we have a couple of questions on housing. 
uh, firstly, how does the Housing for All campaign or program or slogan, how do we address the question of well-being in terms of shelter? And secondly, how do we explain the paradox of high housing shortage with the simultaneous high stock of vacant houses? The fourth question, the fourth third question, uh, is based on inclusive mobility and uh, transport. So let me first define what we mean by inclusive mobility. It is to do with gender and disability. And by inclusive and mobility meaning uh, for trans public transport system. So the question being, why are certain aspects being compromised while thinking of thinking? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just repeating. Why are certain aspects being compromised in a system, uh, in a dynamical system, while thinking of inclusive mobility? Uh, the second one being, what is failing in achieving inclusive mobility? Is it planning, policy, attitude, regulation, regulation, or design? The third being, who and what are being excluded? Trying to trying to achieve accessibility. Okay, so that's that sort of three part question can be folded into sort of one. I think it's very important. What is it about public access systems that make them exclusive to certain publics? So the last question from our group uh, deals with these binaries that we have of legality, illegality, formality, and informality, and how uh, across different classes, various sets of people deal with, negotiate and understand this and how uh, this term that came about in the morning, community of interest, how they finally determine the outcomes. What we did was we kind of uh, uh, put the mic around the front. <laughs> but we started kind of uh, uh, discussing what are the questions that come to mind uh, when we think of the urban and something that comes from one's own experience. So there were there were there were these questions of anxiety which which emerged, and the questions of anxiety were uh, why is my city so filthy? Uh, what do I do? What am I doing about it being so filthy? Uh, how does the city become environmentally sensitive and socially just? Um, how do we solve the housing problem? Uh, how do we make cities more comfortable? So these are the these are the questions which 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 started uh, emerging. These are questions of uh, anxiety, you know, uh, how do you kind of uh, what we did was we then undertook a discussion around these uh, emerging uh, questions of anxiety and tried to make it more ontological, you know. So for example, the question of how do you solve the housing problem became what is a house, you know. And when you ask the question, what is a house, then things become, you know, then it, 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 it has many, many possibilities, which are possibilities not only for actual, you know, writing poetry, but also to formulate policy. So, so you, you, have, you have a whole variety of things that are possible, and things that which, which, which look feasible are also possible. So, for example, the question, why is my city so filthy and what am I doing about it became what is filth. Uh, how do we make cities comfortable became should we plan at all. We inverted that question of how cities become environmentally sensitive and socially just. No, what is it? Environmentally sustainable and socially just. We made it how do cities become environmentally just and socially sustainable? So, I mean, what we what we try to do was we, we try to invert it. We try to kind of as as, as uh, 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 what Karma say, open it up in a manner that they become useful in a useless way of course. But it becomes useful to uh, to interrogate it further, more fundamentally, ontologically, and. That provides many possibilities, you know, many different kinds of possibilities. Otherwise, otherwise, a question like how do you solve the housing problem lands up in housing rights, which is which is a very fairly easy question to kind of you know get through, and then you know the solutions for it. Policies. So we made it more ontological. to actually show something very interesting that happens when I am actually reporting the questions. Because 
many of the questions were not actually framed as questions to start with. They were framed as observations of an empirical phenomenon. The observation of an empirical phenomenon, which is that people seem to be becoming more and more wealthy in some places. You have barbed wire fencing which go very tall, very high. And yet, when you step out of their houses, that lane is impossible for anyone to move in because their large cars are occupied the entire road. Right? That's an observation. The question from that can be framed in many different ways. We can say, why is this happening? How is this happening? And we can even ask, what exactly is happening here? Do we even know that is what the others point in? That we often think that we know what is happening. And we may not be knowing what has happened simply because of the way in which we are describing it. So the way in which we describe the empirical phenomenon itself makes a huge difference each time. So what are some of the processes that are being described in our group? One is what I have just said, that as wealth seems to be increasing, it seems to be impossible for people to navigate these streets. There's another flip side to it, which actually was very interesting, that in a time when so much work, so much talk, so many resources are being spent on eradicating open deprecation, there is a very large number of people in Delhi, 40% of them live in slums, which occupy 0.5% of the land extent. That's the that's the, the, the dramatic nature of that reality. And there was a toilet, many of them. And the places where they defecate are actually being occupied. They're being occupied for parks, they're being occupied for something else, something else, something else. Some formal language is being imposed on that. And often, something other is also going on. A lot of good trucks which come into the city because there is no other place to stop, they park in places where people actually go and defecate. So that land is being lost, and that's a terrible process. So on the one hand, we are talking about navigating in wealthy affluent colonies, public space becoming shrinking, smaller and smaller. And on the other hand, we are also talking about that same space not becoming available any longer, not remaining longer available any longer for open So those are the kinds of empirical phenomena. A few other empirical phenomena that we described are about potholes on the street. They seem to be appearing and appearing and appearing. And there's a very interesting process behind it, which Jara was describing, which is that the tendering process for digging up, for engineering works, starts from digging and closing it. And each department, water works, telephones, electricity, whoever, goes through that entire cycle, which means that I dig and I close. And each time, the same thing has to happen. So each time, I get the right to dig over the other department. And only I am allowed to close it. Nobody else will close it because the tender doesn't allow for that to happen. That can lead to another very interesting question that Rihan was asking about floods in Delhi, where it seemed like there are thousands of people, thousands of government agencies who are all under pressure to act, and they all come and act out whatever they are supposed to act out and go away, without being under any compulsion to talk to each other. So I come and do my gig and go away. The subject comes and does and his own gig and he goes away. And we don't have to talk to each other, there is nothing. So in that sense, is there anything for the government at all? The flip side of it would be that in that in that case, do we really want a very authoritarian government which is completely in control of everything and knows exactly what it is doing? Right? So the reason why I'm going through the, the empirical descriptions, another one was, was a very interesting case um, from uh, Anand Panini about Banaras. Murdo ko jalane wale shahar, puja ke shahar ban jata hai. Puja ke shahar se wo university town ban jata hai. University town se phir health center ban jata hai. Right? We go on keep adding more and more functions to the same city, forgetting that the original function of the city was something very small. And maybe that's all that it could support, but we don't know. And we go on adding things to it because it seems like it would be powerful thing and it would break down. So, 
So given all of these, given all of these empirical phenomena, I listed out a few things which I think is a very important for all of us to think about. From now. There are normative assumptions that we all make that some things should be happening, some things should not be happening. We don't necessarily know that those assumptions are right, but we live with them because those are the values that we believe in and that we have grown up to believe in. Right? For example, we all believe that everybody should be able to have some kind of a decent way of dissipating. How can anybody be denied that? Right? It's a norm, it's a value that we want to believe in. But we have to think about what those norms are repeatedly. Because it's those values which are being reflected in the way in which we are asking questions. Sometimes it's for the good, sometimes it's for the bad. Whatever it is, we need to be self-conscious, we need to be self-aware of what those norms are. Together. Second thing is the self-evident categories, which is one of the things that Prasad was pointing out. Do we even know what, what the hell the house is? We don't know. Right? We need to ask. Do we know what public and private means? When we say private wealth, public space, do we know what those things mean? Are they more complicated than that? What does the empirical tell us? What, is the, what are the different ways which we can re rethink them? Those are the kind of things that we need to think about. Positive linkages, right? That you start building these cities and ultimately it is going to lead to some kind of an automatic collapse because it has become too big and too powerful. If a city collapses, we then assume that it has collapsed because it has become too big. Maybe it is, that's not necessarily the truth. How do we take care of those kinds of assumptions that we make? We all assume that we know why people are acting in certain ways. Maybe they don't. Maybe all of these government agencies actually have no clue what they are doing. Maybe they don't really have that intention. They are acting because of some internal logic. I, mean, I remember one wonderful case from my childhood where in the parade grounds here there used to be a park and there used to be a soldier standing next to it. Always. And nobody knew why the man was standing there. So somebody went and actually dug out the old archives and we found out that the, the bench was painted at some point. And the officer didn't want anybody to be sick on wet paint. So he posted a man there. And then it just continued like that. The man has actually been standing there for years. <laughs> so there was just posted at the other page. <laughs> Different man. <laughs> One man has gone, the other man comes and stands right there. So there are, there are sometimes, this is not quite the intention, right? And then the moral and political litmus. We all, we all, assume a certain kind of moral legitimacy. We demand that there should be certain kind of moral legitimacy. Maybe we need to think about what those legitimacies are actually and where does that power come from? Where do people draw that kind of power? Very often it's, it's through association, right? The association is that the moment you say that, that uh, I'm standing in a line like this, Soldier is standing in the border, we think that both of them are the same. They may not be. So we need to be very critical of, of those kinds of assumptions when we ask our questions. So, uh, so just to close, I think that the intention of our workshop, as we said, was to, to give us ourselves some time to step back from a kind of emphasis on how to act, how to move, what to do in that immediate imperative that we have. To step back and say, what is it that we're trying to get at? What is the way we should take the question? But I think the four groups have given us a really wonderfully different way of doing so. Um, and I think that there are, what, what is very nice about hearing different types of questions is that these immediate triggers in your mind are what you see that provoke the questions. You go back to the core observation, that thing that made you ask, it roots the question. It gives you ways of moving. It also gives you sometimes fundamental ways to rethink your own core assumptions. I think that's what questioning and reflexivity are so key about. And we don't, I think one of the things that I've talked about was how some of the reasons why we ask certain questions and not others is not because we think that one is more important than the other, but we were trained to ask certain questions versus others. We were trained in disciplines, we were trained in practices, 
and it takes very long to unlearn and think about questions. And the, the point about the kitty is that it doesn't care what you were trained at. And the point about the problems of real life is they don't respect the boundaries of your practice or your definition of your business card. So I think constantly going back to the fundamental questions, when I think of the question of what is a house, what is a house is at the same time the most abstract and the most pragmatically bureaucratic question you can ask. And that's the beauty of questions. Because we are stuck with 25 square meters carpet area as the answer to what is a house in practice. But we are unable, as long as we keep thinking about how to deliver housing, but don't ask what it is we're delivering, we will keep going back into trying to put smaller, smaller band-aids on much deeper and deeper wounds. So here's to questions, here's to, quest here's to questioning, um, but here is also to not question the closure of this session in the need for tea. So we're going to break for about 20 minutes outside for tea. And then there are two parallel sessions. Dr. Nitapatil is here for Bayport Research, Bukhar and the work in Mumbai, and the design. Um, and Agud is there and the other in the Hall B on the left as you come in for the design studio, design clinic, design lab, design diagnosis, career, fix career, career, question, food, show, answer, career. What is the design clinic is what we're calling it, right? All right, so the design clinic that will be in the thing in about 20 minutes. Thank you very much.